Any specific questions before we roll? Well, we're already rolling, so it's a little late. But anything specific? Okay, we'll look at a, a couple of, again, of these open system questions. Now, our operating, our operating uh, equation for this is the uh, conservation of energy, the first law. We treat these things as a control volume. So we look at how much the energy content of that control volume changes with time. That content, if it's increasing, we might be in uh, startup mode of some kind. Decreasing, we might be in kind of some kind of shutdown mode. But it's going to come from either some heat being added to the control volume. Might also be some work done by the system. Remember, we consider work being done by the system is positive, hence the minus sign, because of positive work being done by the system. Let's see what she does. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what is the disregard for, for traffic conditions? You know what that is? You know what that, that was right there? What the, that was displayed right there? It was Jeep owners. That's how they drive. I need to go somewhere. Something's in my way. Doesn't matter. I'm going there anyway. Jeep owners. Oh. You drive. Something reasonable. Something human. Something humane. A pickup truck. Just, just see? He knew. Just a pickup. It doesn't matter. It's just a pickup truck. It's to pick up stuff and carry. It's a pickup truck. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See, he didn't say, uh, I own a Ford 350. Because he knows that doesn't matter. It's just a pickup truck. God, oh, man, good for you. All right, plus any energy actually being convected in by any mass flow. Now, remember, this could be uh, at multiple places. Uh, in fact, any one of these could be. We could have multiple places where heat is being transferred into the control volume or work is being done. Uh, we'll especially see this when we get to system analysis and our control volume is actually a couple of these smaller open systems all linked together into a full power plant type thing. Um, but that's uh, a matter of the... Uh, inlet energies being convicted, convected in with that mass itself. Um, and the fact that, of course, there's also the same kind of thing being convected out. As mass travels into and then out of the system, we're going to see some energy actually being carried along with that. For shortcut, sometimes we just say, call these E. So that would be E in, E out. And then, just rearrange things. Uh, our problems that we'll be dealing with, we're not going to deal with the, the transient part of the uh, of these systems as they run. We're not going to look at startup and shutdown. Um, just don't have the time to do it. Uh, some colleges do this course as a four-hour course. They have that kind of time. We only have a three-hour course here, so we'll keep it uh, keep it uh, to a steady state analysis only. Not necessarily assumption. Many, many plants run at a steady state for at least considerable periods of time. Um, power plants can kind of uh, swing up and down as demand comes and goes. Um, there's a couple hour lead, leg time with that, um, of course. 
Uh, but for the most part, uh, we can treat things as work running at steady state. For us, that will mean that the energy content of the control volume itself is a constant. Because of that, we're most concerned most concerned with not the individual energy values of the inflow, other than uh, H, we tend to depend upon those, but we're most concerned with delta Ke and delta Pe more than concerned with the individual values of the kinetic energy and the potential energy themselves at the inlet. We're mostly concerned with are those things changing. Uh, that's very true of the potential energy change. It, it just does us no good to wonder what's the potential energy of the mass flowing in when what we really care about is the change between the two. The kinetic energy, we might care about it at a particular place, an inlet or an outlet, if we need to find that velocity or if we need to use that velocity. In fact, we'll have a, a problem kind of like that that we'll do coming up here. So that's our, that's our operating equation for these open systems. That covers just about everything we need to do. The only way I can make it again more complete is put summation marks, uh, summation signs in front of each of those to say that uh, we could have multiple places where those things are going on. Okay, so you, you got that and can work with it, then at least four of the six problems on Friday's test should be doable. Good block. Alright, so let's do a couple problems and put that equation to use. Just to, some of what we need to do, I'm sure, is, is just warm up from a long break. So one of the components I don't think we've looked at yet is a condenser. A condenser is a heat exchanger whose main purpose is to turn steam into liquid water. Um, that might happen for two reasons. It might be that the steam is going to be discharged from the plant and they need to turn it back into liquid, cool it down enough before they can just put it back in the uh, in the lake or the stream that might be there. Uh, you can't just inject, well you can, inject steam into a, a lake or a river, but one thing that happens, and if you've had pet fish you know this, if the heat gets too high there's not enough oxygen and the fish then to get more oxygen like to swim upside down. That and I, I don't know how, maybe they breathe through their belly buttons or something. Um, I don't. You don't breathe through the fish's belly button. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think I might? <laughs> you, you go off in weird directions sometimes, Alan. Just, just even thinking that might be a possibility. Who's pointing me there? That's what I want to know. So, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll look at that, treat it as a heat exchanger, but the purpose, oh, the other purpose of turning steam into liquid, is, especially as we'll see in power plants in uh, a couple weeks, is that uh, for the plant cycle to run, that it has to get back up to pressure after having gone through the turbine, it's much easier to pressurize a liquid than it is a, a, a gas. And so it is economically uh, worth it to take the steam and liquefy it, pressurize it, and then reboil it back into steam. So typically it's done with a, uh, 
uh, the steam going through in one line and cooling water coming through in the other line. Uh, this isn't that much of a schematic of exactly what goes on in. Uh, there, there's often, very often, a lot of twists and turns inside a heat exchanger in order to increase the heat transfer area. The greater the heat transfer area, the greater the chance for the heat transfer. But it's not really done like this. This is just to illustrate uh, in a sort of cartoonish way that there's uh, a heat exchanger going on here. So it's typically a matter of heat leaving the, whoops, leaving the hot stream coming down to the cold stream, which cools off and or condenses the steam and of course tends to heat up the water. It's uh, uh, the cooling water. Never, I don't think, would there be any case where this was done to boil the water to make it into steam, because you already got steam anyway, so you're not gonna you're not gonna make a, a whole lot of progress with that step, that step. All right, so we'll number our stations, if you will, and that's where we take our state points. Part of this analysis again is remember uh, not that there's no change between those, but that as time goes by, the conditions at those points are always the same. So I'll number them something like that. <coughs> and then we're given some of those state points as uh, preconditions. Cooling water comes in at 30 degrees, sorry, 20 degrees, goes out at 35. With what we'll consider to be very, very little pressure drop. Uh, that's a fine assumption for first analyses. If you ever end up working in the heat transfer business, then you're going to be very concerned with the heat transfer. Uh, sorry, with the pressure drop through the through these systems. P3, one atmosphere, uh, 45 degrees.
per unit mass from one system to the other. All right. On most of these, in fact, I think on all of these, start with the the uh, first law of balance on the control volume itself. The control volume being the uh, heat exchanger itself. We can individually do the streams as a control volume since they don't mix. Um, but to start with, this should be just fine because we can get the heat transfer if we can find out the individual, or we can get the mass ratios if we can, if we can do it on the whole control volume. So uh, M dot one, let's just put it this way. M dot one E one plus M dot three E three. Those are the two inflow streams. And then we have a difference between those as mass flows out. So our first law of energy balance for this problem in its full form uh, would look something like that. And just to be clear, this is control volume heat transfer and control volume work. We have heat transfer within the control volume, but not into or out of the control volume. At least none is mentioned. So we'll uh, assume that that's than uh, an adiabatic heat exchanger. Steady state conditions, so that term's going to be zero. No heat transfer into or out of the heat exchanger itself. Within it, yes, there's heat transfer, but not out of the entire heat exchanger itself. And it's just a heat exchanger, just stuff flowing through the pipes, not doing anything else. So there's not any work being done on or by the system. And for this problem, since nothing else is given, we can't do anything other than assume to that there's no significant heat uh, uh, kinetic energy change between the inlet and the outlet, or potential energy changes between the inlet and the outlet. If you're not told otherwise, if you're not either asked to find something about those or told something about those, assume that there, the changes are zero, are zero. By that I mean the change is the water goes from one to two, and the change is the steam goes three to four. Um, we'll take all those to be zero. So we're left with M dot one H one plus M dot three H three equals M dot two H two plus M dot four H four. The, uh, the heat coming in, uh, the, the energy coming into the control volume comes out of the control volume. That's a, a factor of both the steady state assumption and the uh, adiabatic assumption. Remember what that means, adiabatic? <coughs> nope. Nope. Adiabatic. means what? Yeah, that is, this is an adiabatic heat, uh, heat exchanger, so uh, heat transfer is your individually 
neither of the flow streams is in adiabatic, but the heat exchanger as a, as a whole is. So it's uh, then we're looking for m dot one over m dot three. We can divide through by m dot three. So that side's easy, but then remember that m dot one equals m dot two since we're at steady state, and same for the three and the four. So this is the same then as uh, dividing through by m dot four on this side. So there's what we're looking for. Uh, that is equal to one, that's equal to one, and then this also equals that ratio, m dot one over m dot three equals m dot two over m dot four. So all this, only two things left really. One is a little bit of algebra, and the other is, well, we've got to find those H's. And then, uh, if possible, sketch it on a, uh, on a diagram. So let's just, I think, be H3 minus H4 over H2 minus H1, if I did the algebra right. That gonna do it. H one minus H two, yeah. Or either way. Yep, yeah, that'll work. No, Chris? Let's double check. It's easy to get it wrong. M dot one and three is the same as two over four. So we got H one minus H two. Got the opposite of that, and then this can go over there, and we'll have H4 minus H3. We got the opposite of that, so I think we're okay. So, a little practice for you um, find out what, uh, what those H's are. And since not all of you have the English tables, I'll put them up for you. All you have to do is say, hey, put up uh, such and such a table. Or scooch over to the one friend you still have. There's no friend's gone. Oh, you get up and leave? Yeah. Is that in there? Alright. Um, Clearly, these things should be in compressed water. Remember, those tables are very sparse because not much happens in those tables. liquid tables, which is certainly what the cooling stream is, are very sparse tables. 500 psi, it's taking 500 psi jumps, and the temperature is taking jumps of 50, so uh, we don't have a lot going on in here. Um, you might think, come on, let me, let, me, uh, let me at least hit the 20 degrees, but yeah, you can try, but the pressure's way off and all kinds of things are bad. That's a yeah. Uh, oh, this this problem is not interesting. Well, there's the first trouble. There we go. Still the same thing because these tables are just as sparse. Uh, five megapascal jumps and uh, jumps of 20 degrees centigrade. So the 20 degrees centigrade is on here, but that's at a pressure of five megapascals. Um, how many pascals is one atmosphere? Like what? Yeah, 
it's 101 kilopascals or 0.1 megapascals. So it's ill-advised to go to some place, even though the temperature is about right, the pressure is just so terribly far off. So what do you do? Give up. That's what some of you do. What would my favorite students do? Let's see who stepped up for that. Phil, gonna take that? No. I would, but I wasn't listening. <laughs> we have 20 degrees on the compressed water table. In fact, in several places. But the lowest pressure is 5 megapascals, which is way over what we've got here. 50 times higher than what the pressure we've got there. So it's not advised to use these compressed liquid tables for the H1 and the H2 that we need. What do you do instead? Well, wait. You're talking about the pressure at Well, it doesn't matter. You don't even have those pressures, so what are you going to do? Just assume it's 5 megapascals? Remember, this is typically just uh, either simple water, water from the, the municipal system, or it's uh, water right out of a river or something. So it's pressure, it's, the pressure is going to be somewhere around the, the one atmosphere. Go back a table to superheat. No, two more. Table A4. Table A4. Not the pressure table. We don't have the pressures. Couldn't use it anyway. So what we do is remember that H is mostly a function of temperature. And so we can just take it as the saturated values and leave it at that. You can check on the pressure tables. H doesn't change a whole lot. We don't know what the pressure is anyway, so it doesn't matter. So we'll go to 20 degrees and saturated liquid and just use that value, 83.9. 83 So, uh, so that's H1. And as long as the units are the same, which they will be when they come out of the same table, we don't need to care what the units are. We're looking for the ratio. Uh, so that'll be unitless. Coming out is 35 degrees. So H2 with 35 degrees.
95% quality. Yeah, I see. We've got three values there to use mm -hmm. at one atmosphere. What do we do? Since state point three is Thank under you. the dome, we have to take into account its quality. We do that with HF plus X three HFG. And that's uh, those, uh, we only need then the first two numbers, 419.1. HFG, remember that's just the difference between these two. It's a matter of convenience. It's in the table. 22.56.5. And that's all kilojoules per kilogram. Which is the same units on all of the other ones. So, if somebody come up with what that equals. What's that? Temperature, we know the pressure as well, because it's about atmospheric. Remember, <coughs> we're condensing it, so this is a liquid. And if we're look, looking for the liquid state points, remember it's much more a factor, of, a factor of temperature than it is pressure. So don't use the pressure table. Use the temperature table. And we have that temperature, 45 degrees. So uh, 188.4. Same units, top and bottom, so that will give us the mass flow rate, uh, the ratio of the mass flow rates between the water side and the steam side of the heat exchanger. Anybody have to have that? It's about oh, 36, a little bit more than that. What? 37.2 uh, steady state ratio of the uh, mass balances. Questions about that part? Because there was still another part left. I find Q dot. Any questions about that, that mass ratios? Just be careful. Um, you know, just draw a nice little picture of it. Keep the temperatures, pressures, and, and the light that you're given uh, straight. Why didn't we find quality at state point four? 
Why didn't we find the quality at state point four? Mm -hmm. It's a condenser, so it's coming out as liquid, its quality would be zero. So by using H4, uh, H4 is saturated at that temperature, we're, we are using quality zero. All right, so for Q dot, where's that going to come from? go back to either one of the fluid streams and treat it as the control volume. So uh, we'll pick it and one we'll, uh, we'll pick the cooling water which would be 1 H1 minus and dot 1 H doing this for the cooling water. That's already taken into account there's not significant uh, potential energy changes or kinetic energy changes. Not only is the entire unit exchanger operating in steady state, but so is the uh, individual streams. What about Q dot? Huh? Is this zero? Well, no, that's what we're looking for. This is actually Q dot over m dot, we're just doing it for one of the particular streams. So that's definitely not zero. This is, there's no uh, fans or turbulators or uh, uh, any of those kind of things. And so we then have that q dot, which is big Q dot over M dot. Remember M dot 1 equals M dot 2 in this case. And then uh, so we get H2 minus H1. Should that be positive? We've already got H2 and H1. Should it be positive before you even put numbers in? Phil says no. I mean, he's got a very determined look on his face. Taylor yes. rolls her eye every time Phil says something. Yes. Yes. Should this be positive before you? I mean, you've got H2 and H1 in front of you, so you already know, but should it be? Do we have the algebra right? We're talking about the cooling water with heat coming in. So should that be positive? Yeah, it sure should. This should most definitely be positive. And we've already gotten both of those numbers and there's nothing new to do. Um, what's that come out to be? About 2276, something like that. I think the numbers might be slightly different. Was that about it? angry. What? I did not personally end spring break. It's just it's school policy. We all had to come back. I'm not any happier than you are. What? 62.7? Oh, because we're doing it on a per mass basis. Yeah. Uh, if it was the total heat transfer, the amount lost by this stream has got to equal the amount gained by this stream. But on a per mass basis, it's slightly different. So this comes out to be what? 
62.7, and that's kilojoules um, per kilogram. It's kilowatts per kilogram. It's probably the easiest way to put it. And if you do it on the steam side, you'll find that's a, a bigger number because there was a, a lot less mass flow on that side. Control volume, whether we take the whole thing as a control volume or just one of the streams as a control volume, which we can do because the two streams don't mix. Heat added to a control volume is positive. Uh, that came about when thermal was first uh, really being developed. It was during the age of the development of steam engines. And it kind of makes sense anyway, because the heat typically, uh, as, as we're going to be looking at power plants and other uh, general power producing things, when you put heat into these things, that heat you have to pay for. It's either coal that you have to buy and or dig up. Back in the, those days, there was a lot of trees you had to go chop down. Uh, now it's oil, natural gas. Um, well, it, we, we can use the sun. Free. I don't know if that's enough heat to run a major power plant, but you can do okay at home. All right. You see those ones that have down where uh, the, the big one with all the mirrors? Out in the desert? Yeah. So the whole we would all go yeah. to one one collection yeah. spot at the top of that tower. Yep. And all that all that's at the top of the tower is a boiler. Yep. It's just a steam steam generator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll be looking at power plants a lot. Um, we'll just model them usually as heat being input. Where that heat comes from is an entirely different problem. Okay. Another problem. An air compressor. That takes an inlet stream and then greatly pressurizes it for whatever purposes. We typically show it like that as gases get pressurized, they tend to get smaller, so compressors themselves, at least uh, these type of compressors, do tend to actually decrease in size until out comes a pressurized gas. Yes. Um, if we're doing a liquid rather than air, uh, we'll use a pump. And these things work because uh, work is being uh, done, applied to the shaft, and we'll take that to be uh, um, work into the system. So, a couple things known. One atmosphere, inlet. Volumetric flow rate, 8 cubic feet per second. Outlet flow velocity, 225, and a pressure of 150. PSI. One atmosphere and pounds per square inch. They have to know it offhand. 
Uh, all, all problems on Friday will be in SI units because I know some of you don't have the English tables, but I, you need to see the English units. The reason we use the international edition is just to save you some money. So you can buy me a bigger present at the end of the year. And you can pool all your resources to help. Except some people have jobs at very big corporations. And buy off-brand pickup trucks. Save even more money. One atmosphere is about how many PSIA? 14.7. So we can see that the, the fluid was pressurized a lot. The other thing we're given is that in passing through the um, compressor, the product of P times V to the 1.3 is a constant. Remember what that kind of process was called? And big points for whoever got that. Whoever remembers that. Big big points for whoever remembers that. If anybody remembers that, it's big, <laughs> big, <laughs> big. <laughs> Taylor, you're right. <laughs> was that your voice, Dan? Yeah, polytropic process. Uh, not a process possible with condensation or mixed phase flow. So don't try to apply this kind of thing when, uh, when looking at, at steam uh, or steam production of some kind. Are polytropic processes on the uh, exam? Doesn't look like it. Yeah, maybe they should be just for funsies. Because you guys like them. Well, one of you does. <laughs> no? All right. Okay. So, um, I want you to find the outlet pipe diameter. So let's think a little bit where that kind of thing is even going to come from. What can we work with that's going to get us to the pipe diameter? We have the volumet volumetric flow. We have the velocity. So those are uh, those are sort of related in that m dot times a over v little v, but a v is just the volumetric flow rate. So there's that right there. Presumably this V, and if we're specifically talking about uh, the outlet area, well there it appears right there in that part, this specific volume presumably we'll be able to get from this because we know the pressure increase, we know the, this product is constant, then we can use that to also find the volume uh, decrease. So that should lead us to then the outlet uh, diameter. So set that up a little bit, see what you get with it. I'm going to have a little cocktail break. I don't know, why don't you ask the expert on polytropic processing? <laughs> <laughs> what a bastard if I thought I was going to get an answer. Oh. <coughs> you two have an issue? It's, clo it's closer to the chemistry. Yeah, the, uh, this exponent, 
is on the V only. It's not on the product P times V. If it was, we'd use parentheses. Order of operations. Maybe someone else needs to take my math 108 class. <laughs> I'll save a seat for you next fall. Volumetric flow rate in the same as the volumetric flow rate out. Does V1 equal V2? Dot. that one thing that happens to these gases as they get compressed is they actually get smaller. So if mass is going to be conserved and density goes up, then these can't possibly be equal. It is true for incompressible flow, like water, liquid water. It's not true for gases or, or even multi-phase mixtures like steam and uh, like water. Alright, so most of what you have left is algebra. 
pretty much uh, putting, uh, putting these two parts together with A2 has the D2 in it and B1 over B2 ratio. You can get the ratio from those without having to know either one of them in particular. Right, Malcolm? like 4 over pi, that just comes from the d squared. The volumetric flow rate at 1 over the speed at 2. This is just the algebra. values pieces now and double checking the units. So one more minute, see if anybody comes up with a value, gets the big prize. Pipe diameter, some appropriate units, probably inches. Because these 
pipes don't typically aren't typically real big. This is a whole compressor I have in my basement. watch pirate movies? Yes. How many colors do cannons come in? One. Black. I got 1.04 inches. Anybody else? Right. Because that's Alan. Do we? Oh, do we? Do we? That's why I got to ask him if I got it right. I mean, do we got to trust Alan on this? The units work? Must have worked. Yeah, 1.04 inches. All right. We're going to try to get out of class. So we'll put this one together a little bit as a, uh, a multi open system. <coughs> system. Uh, a waste heat recovery system uses the hot gas that comes from some combustion process and it uh, could be all kinds of things even if it's just burning off some of the uh, methane produced by uh, landfills or cow barns. Uh, so we'll take that to be, we'll just model that as uh, waste combustion process. We'll just model it as air. So that'll be our inlet stream. We'll use that to heat up water to produce steam that then is driven through a steam turbine that will then itself produce work. So, just uh, for reference, number of points, uh, significant point. We don't take, in this class, at least not at this level, there to be any significant pressure drop in any of the piping connecting any of these things. Um, if you get into real plant design or analysis of some kind, the pressure drops will be very, very important because those are all considered losses. Out at 260 degrees, 
So its temperature drops a lot because it's giving heat up to the generation of the steam in the water side of the uh, boiler. Essentially no pressure drop. And then the water is coming in at 40 PSI, so that's P3 is 40 PSI A. Number one atmosphere is about 14.7. T3. Hundred and two degrees, which if was your temperature, you could stay home today. Because you'd be sick. M dot three. Four point six pound mass per second. P five. about one PSIA and a quality of 93%. Now you want the quality at the outlet of a turbine to be very, very high because those water droplets with the speed of the blades and the speed of the steam itself those water droplets can actually be abrasive and, and cause considerable erosion on the blades themselves. So uh, warmth is very, very high, if not even still outside of the dome. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to look at some of the things to do to remedy that. Okay, want to find out how much work is going to produce, be produced from this much waste hot air available. Now one thing you can do that would help a little bit is treat the whole thing as a control volume. And then just do your analysis from there. That way you don't have to individually do all the particular steps. Uh, I guess we wouldn't even want the, uh, that pipe coming out of there. I knew somebody was going to call me in that hall. That way, too, we don't even need the conditions of 0.4. We can treat the whole uh, system. We know what's coming in at 1 and 3. We know it's going out at 2 and 5. That can allow us to find the work. So set up that equation. I don't think we'll have time to actually find all of the conditions. But I can give you the answer so you can look it up. Remember, start with the first law.
か。you think? Yes. Yeah, unless, unless you have more information, you're going to have to leave out the any changes in potential energy, which are very, very small anyway. You have to have a pretty big uh, change in height to have those kind of concerns. But you can with change in uh, change of velocity. Uh, but you can also leave those with different pipe diameters slow things down if you need to or speed things up so yeah again take the uh, potential energy changes kinetic energy changes to be insignificant for the control volume as a whole uh, again we're at steady state there's heat coming in as part of the heat content of the mass flowing in but that's taken care of over here. Uh, this is heat coming in from sources other than direct inflow of mass. And so that allows you then to set up um, what you need to find the work output of the turbine. sum of both of those and then they're subtracted. Better? Two's coming out and four, uh, not four, sorry, that should be a five. Remember, we're modeling this as air. 
So do we have air tables? We have uh, ideal gas properties of air, table A17. Since this is in English units, we'd have to use A17E. Those of you that don't have this, that remember this whole table set is on is online. And we have H here. So we needed a what 400 degrees. Oh, it's in Rankine, so be careful. So 860 Rankine. Yeah, so there's H, but we don't have V. So we can get H1 from the ideal gas tables, but we don't have V1. M.1. We need the volume flow rate of the air. Right, but M.1 over M.3 is just... Yes, but that will not give you this. That can lead to... Uh, I, I don't, I'm just saying well, you can find M.1, but I can't even write it on my own here. You're still going to need this, because you're going to need that. It's right there. Yeah, you can get the ratio of these, but just dividing through by one of the masses won't give you this. No, no, no. I know, but you can find M.1 by doing that. By finding what? If you know, if you can find all your H's, you can find M.1 because you know M.3. And all the H's are just a ratio of uh, M.1 over M.3 equals H3 minus H5 over H1 minus H2. I, think. I don't see it. If, if you want to do the heat transfer from here to here, you could do it, but then you're going to need H4. Perhaps an easier way to do it is to remember we're modeling this with air, which is an ideal gas, so use the <coughs> ideal gas law. Because all those things we have, all you have to do is watch out. You make sure your units are right on all of this, and you should be able to get M.1 from that. So let me give you some numbers real quick. 153.8 pound mass per second. The H's you can get off of uh, E's or out of the tables. H1 is 2065 BTUs per pound mass. BTUs is the amount of heat required to raise one pound mass of water, one degree Fahrenheit. H2 is 174. Same units. H3. Remember, take it. Saturated conditions is 70. H5 is just under the dome. Is 103. Same units. And that should be everything you need then. So you can check this before the test. If you have any questions, post them. 814 8. For the work. Comes out to be about 115. About 815 BTUs per second. 